all about. <laughs> this is the summa of his book. In my opinion, it's his best book. As imperfect as it may be, it's a very smart book. But um, with some exceptions, very smart writing is often circular rather than linear. Oh, thank you. He uses the term linear a lot in those two chapters. Do you know what he means by linear? Like su successive now points? Like, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's a linear progression for mathem mathematicians because there's no content in the uh, number. It's a procedural uh, thing. And he's attacking linear thinking. People who think essentially spatially without a real sense of temporality. So what he's trying to do in these two chapters is to link temporality with spatiality. Of course, he thinks each of them is necessary. Spatiality, he means form. Mm. But he has some very unusual formulations, and let's, maybe we can start there and move our way through a little bit. <coughs> One unusual formulation is the idea of a, a fir, an affirmative uh, conception of this utopianism. What does he mean by that in this context? Dystopianism? Dystopianism, chapter six. It's all over the place. He wants to achieve dystopian reality. Did you ask yourself the question? Because you've heard, and you will hear again, a different use of the term you What does he mean by it? Nothing come to your mind? Did you get to chapter six? I'm being good today. I'm listening. I'm, I'm being good today. I'm just listening. <laughs> yes. This you told me. Okay, so let's start a, a different way. What is the conventional con concept of utopia? <laughs> a good space. What? A good space. A good space which is beyond the realm of possibility. Utopia nowhere. is no place. Nowhere. The no impossible. Place. Nowhere, no place. And in May of 1968, the movement reverts that by the slogan demand, uh, again, demand, be realistic. Demand the impossible, which is not so far from where Negri comes in chapter six. He thinks that um, utopia has conventionally meant and continues to mean uh, for most people a world beyond possibility. A good, a, a good world, which we can never achieve. And he doesn't want that. He doesn't think 
that um, we need to invoke utopia to describe the new. So he wants a dysutopian, dysutopian uh, world in which all of our impossible dreams are formed by constituent power. We're going to get beyond this in the middle of this work here. Can I ask about the use of that term, and could you compare and contrast? Because people often refer to, and Marx referred to, the early pre-Marxian socialists as utopian socialists, because it was they based on ideas, they, not they, materiality. They socialists? I'm sorry? The early socialists were, were not Marxian. No, no, right. So Marx often referred to them as utopian, Fourier, St. Simon, and that doesn't seem to be the same meaning that you're referring to here, because the, the critique, the Marxian critique of that was that it was just, let's hypothesize what we'd like to be with no understanding, structural understanding of the... The same thing. That's the same thing, yeah. just with new words. Yeah. Okay. We dream of a new world, and of course, we have a contemporary, by which I mean 20th century utopian populist film. Somewhere Over the Rainbow, sung by Judy Garland in The Wizard of Oz is a contemporary social, uh, utopian song. Especially the last stanza. Where you see, where she, where she sings, birds fly over the rainbow, why, oh, why can't I? That's as utopian an idea as you can, as you can imagine. And of course, the attempt to break utopian uh, conceptions of the good society and of human powers was made by people who actually attached to themselves specially crafted wings and jumped off roofs and died, usually. But they were trying to figure out a way to beat the fate we have of being uh, people on Earth who can make tri trips um, but can't fly without mechanical uh, uh, supports. But there were a lot of incidents of it. And the first example of that that was moderately um, successful were the uh, engineless airplanes people made airplanes that could fly without um, engines under certain circumstances. Not from here to Paris but they could fly some distance. There, you know, there's a left critique of science and there's a right, right critique of science. And the right critique of science is one that is now being uh, purveyed as deniers, 
that's a right critique of science. 97, 98% of all scientists believe in the propositions of what is euphemistically known as climate change. Two or three percent are doubters, and the administration of uh, Trump has picked up the two or three percent of doubters, of scientists, against the overwhelming evidence advanced by uh, the majority, a great majority of scientists. We, of course, I use the word we, I refer to people on the left. We dismiss the doubters because we have become supporters of traditional science. The left critique of science literally ended with the work, I say literally, I mean major, major critique, with Herbert Marcuse's One Dimensional Man. Um, it had a modest sale. Does anybody have any guess as to what its first edition sold? One Dimensional Man, we're going to read it next week. First part, One Dimensional Society. How many copies do you think it sold? In English. I'm not talking about Italian or French or uh, Russian or Polish or whatever. Any idea? Any guess? You can guess and be wrong. 100,000. How many? 100,000. 200,000. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of copies. Yeah. My best selling book, first edition, was about 50,000 copies. False promises. And I thought I had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> 50,000 copies for a book of nonfiction. Uh, which was also semi-theoretical in parts, especially chapter two. But he sold 200,000 copies in one edition and had a second edition, and a third edition actually in English. And so the first edition, 200,000, there's no numbers that I can find that calculate the sum of the second edition with the first edition. But that was 1964 when the um, left critique of science, which was a critique and not a, uh, a, um, a refutation. Left critique of science was almost at its post-Second War War zenith. A part of it was because of the war economy. Is this what technical superiority and scientific truth really amounts to? The nuclear weapons, the uh, conventional bombs that can um, foment as much mass uh, destruction as was fomented in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But um, that's all gone. I don't mean to say it's literally all gone. There's somebody out there writing a critique of science. I, I wrote critical work on science. One book called Science is Power. Um, did pretty well, not great, but did, did pretty well. And I lectured a lot of places. I gave a lecture series at NYU. Eight, eight lectures on science and had a full house. Was that published? What? Was that published? No. No. It was a culmination of a lot of thinking that I had done in some writing. Um, you have a book on science and ideology. What did you say? You did write a book on science and ideology. Right? That's what I said. Science is power. Oh, science is power. Yeah, but 
this, these eight lectures were in some ways more, more pointed, which means they were more narrow. Um, what about Lewontin? I was just going to say the dialectical Lewontin and Levens. Lewontin and Levens, not in our genes. Mm. And the dialectical the biologist. biologist. yeah. The best book is the dialectical biologist. Yeah, I just finished that one. Yeah. And I happen to know, for reasons I'll tell you in a second, that Levens is primarily responsible for something that book, Dialectical Biology. Um, the reason is because I was a friend of Dick Levin's. And uh, I went out to MIT to give uh, a lecture on my uh, book, um, Science is Power. He wasn't there, but uh, people who worked for him were there. He said that nothing was wrong in this part of And then I saw him just at the graduate center, which I believe was the end of our next day. What I had heard, he said, yes, and the one thing has become more and more liberal. Yeah. Which is true. Yeah. You don't find anything reasonable. You don't find anything Anybody who writes from New York Review on a regular basis must be a liberal. Must be a liberal. You want to sit down? Uh, yeah, you can just sit over there. Yeah, let's sit on the table. Do we have any chairs left? I don't think so. I don't think so. Doesn't look like it. What does she do? <laughs> Looking <laughs> for the chair. I don't know. Um, Will this one hold the body? Yeah. Okay, you want to pull it out? Oh, or, I mean, this is no more chair. Do you want to try sitting there, or do you want to sure, pull just it out? Sit there. That's, oh, that's okay. Fine. Thank you. Oh, you can sit on the table up there, too, where you were. That one you might, might be more good. Yeah, that's stronger, actually. Yeah. yeah. Does it feel strong enough? That's stronger than me. I like the biologist. I once asked somebody who was very close personally to your father who wrote the lyrics to uh, somewhere over the window whether he had become a utopian. And this person said, Yip was always a utopian didn't think his party, the Communist Party, was uh, sympathetic to his utopianism, but he asserted it in, the, in popular lyrics whenever he could. Hmm. And I think that, is, that, was, that corresponded to my reading of, uh, of that song. But let's get back to, to uh, Negri. Um, Dystopianism is, a, is an assertion that is also made by Herbert Marcuse himself, that there is no longer any utopian, uh, utopia uh, possible. But he gave a very unusual reason, which is very close to negative, but doesn't express itself in the same way. He said, the reason that we don't have any more utopia is because um, science and technology have taken the impossible and made it real. And that is, you know, the conditions for the good life. He said that having made the conditions for the good life doesn't mean that we have a good life. It means that the conditions which enable philosophers of the 19th and even in the early 20th century to talk about utopia. He said those conditions have been, abol have been abolished by, by progress. 
uh, we'll talk about progress when we get to Marcuse, but it's the same idea. The idea is we have all the conditions we need for the good life for everybody. Stanley, is that the same as saying life is getting better for humanity? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there, you know, let us assume that the, that, let us assume the statistics. Um, there are, uh, according to the statistics, which are made by statisticians, who are the least qualified to be able to make judgments in many respects of all the sciences. Two billion people in the United, in the world, lack the basic means for survival beyond their 20s and maybe 30s. Two billion people are malnourished chronically, which is a formula for death. Um, let's assume that they underestimated by uh, a couple of hundred million. We can still feed and clothe seven billion people, six and a half to seven billion people, with our available resources. The billions that are owned by the very rich, if there was wealth distributed more or less equally, could begin to make a deep debt, dent in the levels of poverty in the world. Deep debt. Whether it could do it entirely is another matter. Right. I mean, yeah. so, but there's an important distinction here. It's, poss it would, it's perfectly possible for everyone to have a good life. Yes. But it's not what's happening. No. Okay. But that's why Marcosa said okay. the material conditions for the good life okay. for everybody are already present. Okay. So therefore, we don't have utopia is always misnamed. Utopia uh, is about the impossible, but we have the possibility for <coughs> moderately good living standards. And of course, we have still two billion people who are below the poverty line, and maybe more. So, so you so know, one of the things you have to hold on. One of the things you have to uh, do when you, when and if you ever watch television. Television has been broadcasting demonstrations, not only Amy uh, Goodman. But uh, PBS, um, the Petroleum Broadcasting System, <laughs> on Channel 13, which comes out every day, shows Iraqi demonstrations, Indian demonstrations, peasant demonstrations in uh, Latin America. And what you see is that those who are demonstrating may be peasants and workers. <coughs> But they're well fed. This is not a world any longer which is characterized by uh, widespread poverty among whole populations. It has now become, in every country, almost every country, not all countries, but almost every country has become a portion of the population, like the United States of course, different, different degrees. And so it is possible to promulgate an ideology which forgets the poor, or more likely blames the poverty on the poor. Right. A lot of people who should know better think that poverty is really caused by indolence of poor people. I was a full-time factory worker, started work in a steel plant in 1954, and I made a dollar eighty for an hour, which was a poverty wage. Now, 
I moved from that in that same plant, you could move as high as four dollars an hour, which was a very good wage for 1955 uh, to 60. Um, but um, I did have a low wage for two to three years. And I, we lived in poverty. I have two children and a former uh, partner, a wife, who have experienced poverty. And I've experienced poverty. It was not until the anti-poverty crusade that was initiated by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and Martin Luther King Jr. brought it to the fore that anybody could, could even acknowledge that America had an impoverished population. Or if they did, it was their fault, the poor's fault. I had a hard full-time job and I went to the new poverty in the city of New York. Of course, we could bid up but in openings world, but they don't always arise. And automobile workers in this country, anybody know what they make an hour? Depends. $31 an hour before the strike. Um, What's well, the top that's tier? Enough, that's enough to live well. But that's the top tier. Yeah, not every tier makes that. Oh, that's the top tier. Right. But the temporary second tier workers, we don't expect them to be counted as workers. <laughs> yeah, but they're proportionate. The temporary workers are making $16. Mm -hmm. Now they're getting more, they're going to get $20 an hour. The doormen in commercial buildings and Manhattan and some Brooklyn apartment buildings are now up to $25 an hour. And that's great in New York City, that's scraping the bottom of comfort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Think about it. How much is $25 times 40? Mm -hmm. 1,000. How much? 25 times 40 is 1,000. What? 25 times 40 is 1,000. 1,000? Yes. Can't live on $1,000 a week decently in New York City unless you were here and got your rent stabilized apartment in 1961. And that's a figure I just made up. But joking aside, that's not a lot of money anymore. And $31 an hour, even in Detroit and Chicago and Cleveland, where there are still a lot of motor workers, that's not um, uh, a lot of money. You can't send your kid to a um, good college. on $31 an hour. When the annual rate for tuition alone in many schools ranges from $30,000 to $55,000 to $60,000 a year. Can I move the books here a little? No, of course you can. <laughs> no, you can. You're even going to have to ask me. Can, um, some, can someone sit here, Stanley? Yes, someone should sit there. We made the space for somebody to sit. Not as fat as you. <laughs> I'm much fatter than she is, Stanley. You're, that was harsh. You got, you got a precious object there. A wonderful person. Thank you. And I apologize. We sent, we sent our daughter, our youngest daughter, to where she wanted to go, Wesleyan, because her grandmother, my mother, had saved CDs for at least half of Wesleyan's fees. 
and we paid the rest of them because both of us worked for wages. And I, at that time, was a full professor at CUNY where we made more money than people made at Columbia. No longer, by the way. Uh, had a union, and mother worked at, at that point at the Village Voice, where she made about $40,000 for a part-time uh, editorial uh, wage in three quarters, because she wanted to have some time for herself. So we had, a, we had income. We, we could do some of that. But people making $25 like doormen, they can't do that. My doorman, one of my, who's now a maintenance uh, uh, person in the, in the house, we have a co I live in a co-op. Um, he consulted me on his child, he's in bright, well, um, rehearsed child, um, where, where he should go. And he said she, he's got an offer for a scholarship from Columbia. Not Columbia, Fordham. To go to high school or something like that. High school. And I said, what else is it got? And he said, nothing. I said, the scholarship to Fordham is worth what John Wynant, Vice President under Franklin Roosevelt, said when he was asked what powers and what activity does a Vice President have. And he answered, a barrel of piss. <laughs> So I simply <laughs> repeated J J John Wynan's uh, advice uh, to my, my, uh, the guy who was the uh, maintenance guy, and he went to, and he, he went to public uh, high school. Uh, it's actually partially sponsored by Bard. There's a Bard High School that he got into, because he's, you know, good. So he didn't go there, he went to City College, which has a high school, which is one of the preferred high schools now in New York City. Um, kids come out of high school in New York City and they don't know anything. They come out of college and they don't know anything. The state schools, unfortunately, are the worst. And if you go to a state school, you gotta get lucky and find a compassionate, teacher. Yeah. But generally speaking, there's no life in the state schools that makes room for children's desire, to use the word of um, negative. Mm -hmm. So this kid now wants to be an engineer because he went to City College High School. Mm -hmm. And that's what they make, engineers. And they need some scientists. When my mother's cousin, who's now dead, was, uh, he died at 87 years old um, in, 19, in 2010, when he went to high school, he went to the best high school in the 1930s in New York City. That was before 38. Best high school. D. with Clinton in the Bronx. And he became a, uh, a, a, a high energy particle physicist who was an inventor 
a writer. When he was getting his degree at Cornell, his PhD, he went, he, he finally ended up as a professor at Scranton, which does not hire people from Patterson State College in New Jersey. Maybe if you end up at MIT or Harvard, you might get the, um, the Scranton job, but they don't hire them from the normal state college or a university. I, on the other hand, did not get, did not get, did not go to undergraduate school or graduate school. And um, how I got my jobs is a matter of, I'm mystified by it. Uh, but I was offered jobs. I never applied for a job after working in a factory. That's another, another story. Um, so do we understand what constituent power is and what his conception is of constituent power? Yeah. You read nothing but constituent power, even if you only read part of the chapters, and the first chapter and the second chapter, or even the first chapter. And you can, still can't answer it? Well, One of the terms that he uses in conjunction with constituent power frequently is living labor. Yeah. He, he thinks in this period of history it's living labor that has the constituent power passes to constituent power. It what is constituent power? It, it is the, move, the, the movement which actually changes the established order of things which quotes Marx. As you said to me once, Beth, you, know, you, <laughs> you don't understand anything. <laughs> It's exactly what Haver uses it. It is the movement that can make change. What is distinctive about this movement? And as compared to Marx, as compared to um, any Marxist who follows Marx, what is distinctive about this movement? Is constantly reinventing itself. Constantly reinventing itself. And, re and regards limits as an obstacle. I'm sorry, can you explain that? I don't quite follow. I'm what sorry. way is constituent power reinventing itself continually? I'm sorry, we had to talk a little louder for me. Could you explain what you just said about that? what makes constituent power, I guess, distinctive is that it's reinventing itself? I don't know quite what that means. I, it's the well, capacity it, it to promote change. Itself. It's, it's essentially a self-perpetuating um, form of power, constituent, which is not external, to the world, but is but con uh, participates in constituting the world, and because he uses that term uh, constantly changing, creating movements that that can change the world. He does something that is extremely unusual about, if not defining it, at least illustrating it. What is unusual? Who are the main figures for him who have really grasped 
constituent power in their own time. I am astounded if you don't have an answer. Working what? people. What? Working, working people. Working people, yes, but who, who uh, gives us the, um, the, uh, the descriptive and theoretical basis for understanding it in their own time? Aside from Marx, who else? This is Rousseau. Rousseau? Machiavelli, you know? Not particularly. He likes Rousseau a lot. Lenin? No. He's very critical of Lenin, all lowers of history. There's two other philosophers that he cites. Machiavelli is one. Machiavelli is one. And who's the other? Goes on a lot about Burke. Spinoza. Spinoza. Oh, Spinoza. Oh, yeah, yeah. Spinoza. Baruch yeah. Benedict Spinoza. For Benedict was the name they gave him in Amsterdam. But he was born in Spain under the Jewish name Baruch. B A R U C H, at the college on 25th Street. <laughs> Anybody here has read Spinoza? Long time ago. I've read Spinoza. We had a study group in this very uh, room of six people, most of whom were, all of, no, most of whom are graduate students. And we studied the prince by Machiavelli, when we studied Negri, and we, and we read, and then they insisted that we do not start with Negri, yet, that we read Spinoza's Negri book. That was the second time I read Spinoza. Not Machiavelli, I read him much more often. Um, Now, what is distinctive about those two other people and his conception, concept of continuum, uh, con con constituent of power, is that they are philosophers of what century? He doesn't mention it. He doesn't tell you, does he? He, he figures you all know. He's not writing for the for the multitude. Machiavelli He's writing for the, the leaders. Machiavelli is in the 16th, 16th century. What? Machiavelli is in the 16th century. 16th century. Right. That's what Spinoza, I just said. Spinoza, 1700s, 1700. early 1700s. Yeah. Pre-Marx. He's mm -hmm. in the 16th century, mm -hmm. which is the 1500s. And so is Spinoza. The nose, I think it's in the 60s. Late 1600s. He goes back. Yeah, he's at the end of the beginning of the 16th century. Um, and what is interesting about that is that capitalism in its modern form had not yet started. It's a phenomenon that is generally attributed to the late 17th and or the 18th century. So he's violating modernity in, 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 in this. He doesn't define constituent power in, or in terms of constituent thought in terms of modernity as it existed, as a reflection on modernity. He's, he's defining constitutive power as such what is distinctive about Negri as, and what he's trying to force upon Marx, which I think is a problem, but what is distinctive about Negri is many things, but the first thing is that constitutive power is not a phenomenon of the modern capitalist order.
it is present in this period of change, however, uh, between a, a feudalism which has not died, is declining, but declining very slowly and still has a lot of a lot of power, and capitalism. So that Beth's view, Beth, Beth's view that constituent power connects to periods of change, mostly, most oftenly, or often effectively, uh, is reflected in this, his conception by even dwelling on Machiavelli and Spinoza, because they are not products of, the, um, of, of modernity as we understand it uh, traditionally. They are in, in the pre-modern, early capitalist phase. So what about constituent power? What else is, is, is characteristic of his notion? So it creates a rupture with time. What, what did you say? It creates a rupture with time. It creates a rupture in time? Uh, with with time? time. It it breaks time. Bourgeois time. Mm -hmm. Is the time that is governed by the working day, by the subsumption of labor by uh, of by capital. Yeah, that's that's right. It's a new beginning. is a fourth characteristic of, or third characteristic actually, of um, constituent power and constituent thinking. Yeah. He, ta he talks about violence and cooperation. Right. As, as, I don't know what no, He's got a couple of things. Yeah. He does talk about that. That's true. But he also does not situate constituent power in a specific historical period. He says constituent power is unstoppable. He uses that word. It can only be appropriated or stopped by absorption. And, well, uh, to give me an examine, uh, example, the nuttiness which um, characterizes our period is that constituent power has been <coughs> displaced and appropriated simultaneously by the technological revolution which never ends. Never, never, never ends. And it is an aspect that the bad use of constituent power to serve the existing system. Mm. So the constituent power does not necessarily mean transcendence mm. of the existing system that can be appropriated. Technological, and you'll see that Marcuse is aware of this and uses the term of technological domination. Of the members of the so-called Frankfurt School, the one who was given the most notice, I'm not talking about by the um, multitude, as maybe he talks about it, but by the um, intellectuals, is Well, sorry, what's the question? Yeah. The question is, of the Frankfurt School, Adorno, Horkheimer, Marcuse, Habermas, um, I can name... Major, well, so the answer is Habermas. Who was given the most notice? Habermas, yeah. Who? Habermas? Given the most Habermas. Marcuse. No. Adorno. 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 
whose love by them and them are almost universally literary critics. Yeah. <laughs> they love Adorno. They think Marcuse is crude. <laughs> they, they don't, Horkheimer they don't know because they, they, they never read anything by Horkheimer. That's <laughs> 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 amazing. But they adore Adorno. I wrote, a, I wrote an introduction to one of <laughs> two or, uh, books by Horkheimer. It's called Critical Theory. Not and people came up to me and said, and said, I was reading Critical Theory by Horkheimer because I wanted to see what Horkheimer's ideas were. Why did you write an introduction to his uh, work? And I said, because he is the founder. He is the spirit of the Frankfurt School. Mm -hmm. Adorno is his pupil. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? I said, that is, that is factual. That's not my speculation. Adorno joins the Institute for Social Research in 1927 at the age, 1928, Anybody, he was born in 1903, so in 1923 he's 20 years old. Mm. So he joins at tw the age 24. Mm. He's, he's a very young man. Mm. Marcuse is five years his elder, but Marcuse joins uh, Adorno in being attracted and being recruited by Horkheimer, whose writings and thought overcomes conventional Marxism, Marxism in the 20s. And I was privileged to being asked by the, transla the, the press that translated Adorno, um, which is the Lutheran press, it's not called Lutheran press, um, to write the introduction, 1972. And I said, why don't you get somebody else to do it? And they said, this is 1972. Without somebody whose name is recognizable, you couldn't sell a, a single copy of a guy named Horkheimer. And we want to introduce him to the uh, English-speaking public. He had written a book, by the way, in 1947 while in the United States called The Eclipse of Reason. If they had asked me to uh, introduce The Eclipse of Reason, which I read in English long before the critical theory essays, I would have said no. And they would have said why. I said because it, it's a, an attempt to popularize what should not be popularized. I don't believe in popularization, and Horkheimer does not do well in popularization, and hardly anybody does well in popularization. But this is something else. I read the script, the manuscript, and I said, absolutely. In critical theory. Critical theory, the collection of Horkheimer's essays. Right in which he has one essay, which is called, for example, which is not something that um, Samuel Bowles or Rick, Richard Wolff would have even paid half hour attention to. One essay called The Latest Attack on Metaphysics. And he takes exactly the same position, Horkheimer, as does Negri in this respect. And that is, with the loss of metaphysics by and large, we have lost more than we have gained by, by acquiring materialism. The latest attack on that metaphysics identifies himself as a materialist, but says we have to be, be a cognizant of what metaphysics still has as our legacy which is the going beyond. 
What do you think of Adorno's attack on Heidegger? Oh. Adorno's uh, writings against Heidegger. And Nicholas writing on Heidegger. Yeah. And uh, Pierre Bourdieu's writing on Heidegger. Pierre Bourdieu wrote a book on Heidegger called The Political Ontology of Martin Heidegger, hmm. in which he says that Heidegger's philosophy is fascist, which is what Nicholas says. Um, what about Adorno? And he, said, and he mentions another, um, a negative mentions another word, another person whose name is Carl Schmidt. Anybody ever heard the name Carl Schmidt? Yeah. Carl Schmidt. He's so unfortunately you know very influential in the well, current. Right. He's unfortunately very influential in, I don't even know if you want to call neoliberal or neo-fascist movements and in the U.S. now. Frankfurt School figures like Telux, the magazine, the journal. Carl Schmitt was an overtly fascist philosopher who in the 1920s articulated the principles of fascist power. He needed a great leader, that great leader has to lead the masses. They have to learn to believe in both his fact and his fiction, you know, as, as fact. Yeah. He wrote five or six influential books, all of which have been translated into English. But I mean, Adorno wrote a book on Heidegger also. He wrote two books. What, do you know what the name of the book is? He wrote, he wrote a book on phenomenology and a book on Heidegger. Right. Yeah. Did you read the book on, on Heidegger? No, I picked it up and looked at it and I was wondering if I wanted to buy it or not. <laughs> you got to read it. I was curious about it. It's a blistering, blistering attack. It, it looked like it. <laughs> if you read Adorno carefully, which literary critics don't do, they read him as they want to read him, they rewrite him, you will discover, I believe, and you can test it out, that Adorno considers himself a Marxist, but like Negri and Marcuse and um, Henri Lefebvre, he believes that if historical materialism is to be considered a serious perspective on the world, it must take into account all the changes, even within capitalism, and those changes have to be theorized. Because Adorno and Marcuse tried to theorize those changes, as did Horkheimer, they were condemned by the Orthodox Marxists. In the United States, they don't even read him, and Marcuse, and they don't, well, they may have read him in the 50s, but they haven't read Adorno in any, in any depth. Adorno was trying right, to The notion him. that, they have, that yeah. the post-Marx events have to be critiqued yeah. doesn't say in what way. They have to be critiqued, which so, implies that they also have to be theorized. Right, but, but you can take theory in lots of different directions. So. The notion that they need to be theorized is one thing. The way they theorized it That's right. is a different from a critical From the perspective of what they call critical theory, uh, Negri does the same thing with, with Heidegger and Schmidt, but in other places he talks about others. Uh, Adorno, of course, didn't confine his critique to the fascists. 
Schmidt and what he considered Heidelberg to be, he also critiqued the phenomenologists, by which I mean um, Merlot Ponty mm -hmm. and uh, You don't mean Hegel's phenomenology? Hegel's phenomenology would be critique throughout Adorno's work, but I'm talking about a book which critiqued phenom phenomenology, Husserl, mm -hmm. and Merlot Ponty are really the chief phenomenologists that he's talking about. Although I think he's, he overstates his critique. It's correct, as it were, so to speak, but I find more, more interest in phenomenology, especially in Merle Ponty, because I think he has himself taken a lot of elements in materialism and incorporated in his philosophical perspective. It, was that your question about the post-Marxian critique? Well, your question. Did that answer your question? Well, there are several levels of post-Marxian. Yes or no? Well, post-Marx critique. One level of post-Marx critique is what I call, and what is generally known as, orthodox Marxism. What it became in the 20th century, Marxism, by and large, with some exceptions, orthodox Marxism, is the almost exclusive, or the exclusive concentration on political economy. The unorthodox Marxists take into account culture, everyday life, social relations, and they take into account other philosophies, not always in condemnation, but in critique, and try to understand the world from those philosophies as well as their own. And sometimes you can adopt some of those uh, views. Um, I think the greatest, um, and I've said this on paper, by the way, the greatest uh, misunderstanding by the Frankfurt School, by Adorno Horkheimer and Marcuse, is a, uh, a, pra a pragmatism. There's a blistering critique of Horkheimer's, Horkheimer does a blistering critique of one of the um, major figures in pragmatism, William James. William James makes crudity into an embarrassment. Uh, his pragmatism is basically blunt, unthought out, and totally undialectical. But Merlot Ponty's um, phenomenology and John Dewey's pragmatism, although not identical with each other, are in many ways more subtle and more multipl multiplicity-minded than Adorno gives them credit. But to say that all pragmatism can be reduced to uh, um, William James is really a serious mistake. I've talked to um, um, serious um, um, Marxists who are very interested in the Frankfurt School, interested in Negri, interested in in um, and and I asked them what they thought of John Dewey. And in several cases, I got an attack, which was really an attack on William James that they picked up from uh, from reading James's work on pragmatism. I said, well, what do you think about Dewey's pragmatism? Well, I said, I haven't read that. Mm. Uh, I, I said, yeah, well, 
you should try uh, doing. Can you make a suggestion? And I would give them my suggestion and, and do it. Uh, suggestions of doing. Who, sorry? And in some cases, what? No, what? Who you suggest? Sorry, I didn't listen. Do we? Ah, do we? Do we? Looking a book on science, quest for certainty. Okay. His earlier book on science, which has got a strong empiricist element, but he's not confined to it. Experience in nature. His book on education, which is deeply flawed but still has a lot of interesting stuff, that's 1916. Um, anyway, start with those three. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask, maybe this is too broad a question. But Call me in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> in saying that I don't know what you want to call it, traditional or orthodox Marxism rests on political economy and the Frankfurt School added or critique that for not considering culture and uh, 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 development. The formulation of that question was we presuppose political economy. But what we were trying to do, he said, is to take into account the role that everyday life, that culture both in, in theater and in movies and elsewhere play in influencing politics um, and influencing ideology. Now, Marcuse died in 1979 in Habermas's house, although he disagreed with Habermas on a number of missions. But he was a full-time professor, retired professor, after 1973 at the University of California, San Diego. I got to San Diego because two of the San Diego professors um, read my book, False Promises, and invited me out to teach one semester. Marcuse and Fred Jameson, who convinced the chair at that time, Joe Summers, a Latin American, to, to hire me. Um, in that period, I got to know Herbert pretty well, and Fred I got to know better even. Uh, I then got a full-time job at the University of California at Irvine after a year of being a visiting professor at Irvine in history. Um, and, but I lived in San Diego because we had a uh, carpool of Irvine professors who lived in San Diego because nobody... Nobody wants to live in Orange County. Nobody wants to live in Orange County. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we lived in San Diego. I mean, actually, I lived in, uh, the, lower pa uh, in the lower part of, um, of, uh, of uh, well, in the midsection of Pacific Beach, Ocean Beach, I mean, uh, in uh, University City. Uh, in San Diego. Um, Marcuse um, was a lively and relatively, in my view, modest person. He thought my shit was made out of perfume, which was not true, because he heard me speak. I gave 10 lectures at, at the University of California in San Diego during that uh, semester I taught there. 
And he attended every lecture and sat up front, in front of front row. <laughs> and introduced me at every lecture. That was an amazing performance on his part. <laughs> but he said so few people in this country, uh, Marxist or not, really try to understand what this new techno techno universe is about. And you're trying to do that. I said, yeah, I'm trying. Um, and, but he was very critical of that. He, of course, was not among those who didn't, who ignored it. But um, I'm going to give you an example which you're going to find maybe amazing. When I got to CUNY in 1983, in uh, 1985 or 6, maybe 7, 1987, a um, geographer who worked a lot in political economy, Marxist, who was from Johns Hopkins, was invited to teach at CUNY Graduate School. And uh, first thing he did is walk into my office and say, what is it like to teach here? I said, you teach anything you want. And that wasn't true of Johns Hopkins. His name was David Harvey. Um, Harvey comes to me three or four years later in the hall. He said, you know something about technology? And he asked me a question in technology. But he never knew anything about technology and thought he was analyzing contemporary capitalism, mm -hmm. which he wasn't. He was analyzing an aspect of contemporary capitalism which may or may not be the most important. But he never bothered to really come to grips with the influence of technology and what the technologies were about historically. He never studied culture at all. I used to, I used to make the, the, uh, the Marxists uh, in the school uncomfortable. I said, you know, uh, um, I followed the Frankfurt School and the Fab in trying to understand culture and understand politics as well as understand political economy. Do you? Oh, oh yeah, 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 that's important stuff. I said, good. I said, so you answer me a question. Okay, shoot. I said, what is, who wrote and where is it from? Now is the winter of our discontent. <laughs> All of them, with one exception, did not know what the hell I was talking about. That's true. That's amazing. What? It's amazing. So I had to tell them. It's the open, opening line of Richard III, mm -hmm. which is not his best play, but maybe his best line. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this was one of the um, motivations when I was much younger. Um, to, uh, not much younger, but 10 years younger, to try to form, start alternative schools. And we did. We had a, the Free University of New York. We had alternate university. We had the Free Association. We had, sometimes we were shut down because of the state education department said, you can't use your own university. But I wanted to start something new because I got whatever education I ever got in a communist sponsored alternate university, which was called the Jefferson School of Social Science. And was on 16th Street and 
Sixth Avenue is a building on 16th Street and Sixth Avenue on the northwest corner. It's on the corner that was that was owned by the Communist Party, which sponsored the Jefferson School of Social Science. What what was interesting about that school is that some of the people who actually taught in the school were part of a unclaimed dissident faction in the, in the CP. They were interested in issues of culture. They were interested in issues of everyday life. They 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 knew philosophy. I mean, not just Marxist philosophy, but they knew philosophy. My mentor, well, not really mentor. He was part of. He was. I took his course, and then he had a study group, and I went into the study group by his invitation. It was Harry K. Wells. Harry K. Wells has written two or three books, but he was forgotten. When the school shut down because the CP was underground um, in, the, in the 50s, he became a, a psychoanalyst, but not a Freudian psychoanalyst. He, he wrote a book called The Failure of um, Psychoanalysis. He became something kind of, uh, and he had another burden, but he knew his Freud. He had graduated in philosophy from Columbia University. But he was also an educated person. <laughs> <laughs> Despite his going to Columbia. <laughs> 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 Eric Foner, who became the president of the American Historical Association, Columbia University professor, just retired a year ago. But he said to us, he said to me, when I was teaching at Columbia for two years, in 79, 80, I subscribe to your journal, Social Text. I don't understand very much of it, but I try But social text was, you know, a, a wide-ranging journal. It's now an academic journal, uh, 100%. But it wasn't that way all the time. Fred and I started it. Jameson and I started it. Um, the guy named John Brinkman. Um, but it was interesting that um, Wells's view was not reflected in the official line of the socialist Marxists like Michael Harrington uh, or the communist Marxists, crazy communists like Sam Bowles and Herb Ventus and uh, Victor Perlow and all those people in their purely political economy. And Bowles is basically a Keynesian. Not a, not, a, not, a, not a Marxist, even of the traditional kind, but calls himself a Marxist. And most yeah. of the people who now call themselves Marxists, who are economists or philosophers, most of them are orthodox in the sense that political economy is their limit of their understanding of Marxism. Can I ask, could you compare, contrast, reconcile, I don't know, the, the Frankfurt School critique with those who say the notion that Marxism is solely political economy is a, is, 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 wait, 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 <laughs> is a narrow reading of Marx that Marx didn't, was did specifically said, I'm, I'm neither an idealist nor purely a materialist, I'm a humanist, and that that is that that is embedded in Marx from no, the get go, and that you so, have to, so you compare have the to Frankfurt be. School maybe with with I don't know Raya Donetskaya and and C. R. Well, James. Raya and, is only implicitly a Marxist of the Frankfurt School, but her book Philosophy of Revolution, Marcuse loved. It was a very good book. I liked it a lot, but not as much as Marcuse did. Marcuse, it seems to me, was so grateful 
that anybody of any stature will take philosophy seriously, much less culture and everyday life and so on, that he overpraised some things, including my own book, which is still in print after 45 years, but it's certainly not uh, equal to what he uh, thought of it. Anyway, um, but they just closed Lordstown, so what? Yeah. They just closed Lordstown, so it may not be long for this world. <laughs> well, they they open up an electrical truck factory and employ union labor, yeah. all ten laborers. <laughs> all ten. I don't know. Um, that's a joke. Lordstown is a big facility. Yeah, it's got about um, two thousand workers. Yeah. And you know the first chapter of uh, Paul's promises is an account of a strike at Lordstown. I know. That's why I said it. <laughs> <laughs> and that first chapter was reprinted or excerpted. No, reprinted all over the place. People didn't read the promises, but they read the first chapter in, in class in traditional schools. I did. What? I read it in class. You read False Promises? Yeah. Uh -huh. In college? Yeah. Where? UCSC. Well, that's a, a special place. <laughs> <laughs> He's talking about the University of California, San... You mean Santa, Santa Cruz? Cruz. Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. History of Consciousness? Or? Yeah, well, it was Bill Friedland. You know Bill. Bill Friedland was, was a pioneer. He was an agricultural uh, sociologist. The Communist Party, which I don't praise very often, had one characteristic which is unique in the 20th century history of American radicalism. It had two things that were unduplicated by others. One, it had a southern section of, of political activists. And all you have to do is read Robin's book, Camera and Hull, to get a, a picture of what they were like. It's a great book. Great book. What is the name of it? Hammer and Hull. Hammer, Hammer and Hull. Oh. The, yeah. The story the, of the second thing communism did, and civil rights. They had. They also had um, a very effective branch in Iowa. Um, a guy named Charles Coe put out a monthly newsletter called Farm News. CP newsletter called Farm News, and books came out. One of them in the 30s by Anna Rochester. Why farmers are poor. Very interesting, very powerful book and circulated, you know. But almost every Communist Party in Western Europe and in the United States and in Latin America, with some very important exceptions, basically ignored what was called by Lenin in his book, uh, The Agrarian Question. Capitalism and Agriculture by Lenin is probably his least read book. It's, what, it's his best book, by the way, in my opinion. <laughs> Not because it's about agriculture, and I think that's central to be a, be a concern, but because it is a thorough going reading of capitalism and agriculture as it applies to Russia. To this day, in the United States, we do not have a single contemporary, by which I mean post-Second World War, book on agriculture written by a Marxist. Even though as 
an agriculture as production, you mean, or as or peasants as people? What, what, which, what do you mean? Both. Well, the political economy of agriculture, certainly, mm -hmm. but also on its culture, mm -hmm. on its politics. Mm -hmm. Why do Eric Wolf, farmers Wolf, 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 vote both in Republican? From a Marxist perspective. Um, why is agriculture still important? The one thing that Eric Fono did understand, along with others at Columbia, is that the development of American capitalism owes, owes itself to slavery. Mm. Without slavery, America would be a country of small farmers. But the, 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 the capital that industrialized America came out of Britain, but mostly came out of the South, out of slave, slave profits. Mm. But Eric wrote a book of uh, 350 pages called Reconstruction about the fight for civil rights after the war, 1863 to 1877, the Reconstruction period of American capitalism. Mm -hmm. And although it's a materialist book, there's not a single theoretical thought in the entire book. Huh. I love the book. I think it's a terrific book, but you know, theory passed Eric by. And that's why he qualified to be president of the AHA. How about the boys? What? The boys on Reconstruction. Yeah. He followed the boys. Mm -hmm. The book is, says in a very little um, para, para, um, paragraph, not even a paragraph, a sentence maybe, that the boys is an inspiration for this book. But what he didn't do, that Du Bois did in his book on Black Reconstruction, is Du Bois' first chapter on Black Reconstruction is called The Black Worker, in which he theorizes that black people and slavery were actually displaced working class people. And that, that the whole of the slave capitalism was built on uh, concepts of social surplus as had been, as Marx defined it. This book came out in 1935 when Du Bois had recently read a lot of Marx. But Eric doesn't do that. He knows what it is. I don't think he dare, dare do that. You don't become president. He, he wrote that book in 88. He became president of the AHA in the 2000s, early 2000s. So he was president for one year. It'll be hard to, try, hard to chart a course when he saw what happened to his uncle, who was a yeah, much uh, more potent Marxist. Uh, and he never had a job, never was able to get a job. Jack, Phil, were two of his uncles, who were his, uh, Monopini historians. Phil finally got a job at Lincoln University in Nebraska, Black College. Oh, yeah. um, I, don't, I, I think Jack was, um, was um, McCarthyized out of City College. But early in the Rap Kudir Committee of 1941, his other uncle was, was Mo Kerner, who was a trade unionist. Henry was a trade unionist. That was his fourth uncle. Henry just died recently. Henry was the head of the Fur Workers Union uh, towards his, the last things he did. But it's, it was endemic to the labor movement of 
1949 through the almost through the uh, 1990s. Oh, you're a communist and supported the law, federal law that barred communists from holding union office, not just paid union office, but union office period. I think they could still be stored, maybe. But certainly not anything beyond that, like a, a president or vice president or a member of the negotiating committee, none of that. So communists were marginalized into a few unions that refused to buckle mine mill Longshore, um, and um, local unions of UAW, locals of UAW, particularly local 600, and uh, one local in New York of uh, car repair people who work for dealers. That was unionized in New York and New Jersey. Under a, under a, uh, a, a guy named Sam Myers, who was a communist in his heart. But he did good things, you know. Uh, he was very active in the union, but very, very few people. And he was tolerated because he did the usual thing, which is to renounce the Communist Party. Mm. How did Negri? Uh, I mean, because he did a lot of work with unions and... Well, he was, he comes out of a proletarian background. He was a law professor. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> he was a law professor who decided that the working class struggle was more important than he entered it, actually. And I think that, uh, 69 in Italy, which is called the Hot Odom, which paralleled May 68 was his inspiration. Hmm. He was 36 years old in 1969. He was at Padua? What? He was at Padua, the university. Padua? Yeah, Padua. Yeah. Uh, Padua. My, my Italian translator was from Padua. Yeah. Do you know, was he or was he not involved with the Red Brigade and the, the kidnapping of Eldemar, or was that just, you know, uh, you know, McCarthy, which chapter, was he really involved in elite putschist like my, my translator, Ferruccio uh, Gambino, my Italian translator for Both Promises, one day called me up and said, can I come over? I said, sure. He came to my apartment and he said, can I stay over? I said, yeah. What's going on? He says, I'm on the run. I need places to stay that will protect me, so I came to the United States to start with. And uh, he said, not all the people in his group, which was the Negri group, um, participated directly in the Ed Red Brigade, but they were not hostile. They were not hostile. That was enough. Some did, but I got the impression that Negri did not directly, but he was probably praising them in print, which earned him imprisonment. Mm. Finally, uh, he, he, he fled to Paris rather than serve in prison and then went back <coughs> to Italy to serve in prison and was finally released. Pardon because the prison sentence was much longer than the amount of time he actually served. I found Negri to be a very distant guy. 
I was invited to Venice where his group had his headquarters. He had a group of about 600 members throughout Italy. Some of them were running for local office. Um, he had a, had a, um, a paper, it wasn't in the daily, it was not even a, a weekly, it was a monthly. Uh, he himself, I spoke at a conference that they held. That was why I was invited. I found him to be a distant, unfriendly guy. But he was 73 years old at the time. Some people change in their 50s and 60s because they are discontented with the way the world has treated them. Mm -hmm. I mean, he introduces in the sixth chapter, which I urge you to read. We haven't done so already. A category called love. Without explanation, his argument is that all you need is love, 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 love. That's <laughs> <laughs> all you need. No, that love Before is the, the dimension of constituent uh, activity, constituent thought, contemporary power, that all the rest of them deny. And uh, he promotes love. He also does something which is quite unusual for any Marxist, except the Frankfurt School. He approvingly cites one of the uh, most prominent liberal sociologists of the early 20th century, Max Faber who was a very insightful guy and is almost uh, taught universally in sociology programs. Uh, he's uh, not critical at all. Because they're, because they did have insights. To those who think that Adorno was an anti or non Marxist, all you have to do is read Adorno. Not even exhaustively, but read him regularly, you know, read his attack on, uh, on Heidegger and read his uh, criticism. An attack on Heidegger is almost absolute. Read his criticism of uh, phenomenology to see how much he still relies on the categories of, uh, of dialectical materialism. And he uses the word Marxism in more than one occasion. I have a whole shelf of my library here of Adorno, almost a whole shelf. Before we leave, you're invited to look at it. <laughs> His music criticism is kind of strange. Yes. Music criticism. Adorno's? Yes. Well, well, uh, well Adorno, uh, remember a couple of things. Adorno studied music, he studied piano mm -hmm. and composition with Alban Berg, who was one of the great. Um, followers of uh, uh, Arno Schoenberg at the uh, Serial Music School or, or uh, Non-Tonal School. Mm -hmm. For Adorno, that's the only music that is worth listening to in the 20th century, with the possible exception of Mahler, who was both a 19th and a 20th century composer. Um, and why he does that is he said this is this breaks into the comfort you all have 
and listening to music, which reconciles us with the existing social and political order. Mm -hmm. You have to be jolted out of your complacency. And so he wrote a book called The Philosophy of the New Music. And articles in other, and there's a book of his articles on music called K, um, Kezo, Kezo. Um, he has he has his articles on Mahler, on uh, Beethoven. He has a book, an unfinished book on Beethoven. I love Beethoven, my daughter. Beethoven was undoubtedly, from Negri's point of view, one of the um, con constituent powers of the history of music, music after 1800. Uh, for one thing, he broke up the, the symphonic uh, rule of the uh, 18th century, which was that the third movement of the 18th century has to be an andante that was really a, um, a royal um, waltz. Mm -hmm. um, he also wrote a series of string quartets which have a great deal of originality and dissonance. If you listen to his quartets from the 11th to the 15th, they're not easy to listen to, even for people who are familiar with um, dissonant music. But he also dismissed all 20th century attempts at dissonant music, which were not atonal, e.g. Dmitry Shostakovich. All that is Bernstein. I'm just but explicitly close to coverage. Just one How about, is How about Thelonious Monk? <laughs> I'm sorry. Thelonious Monk. No jazz. No. <laughs> no. No. No jazz. He didn't see any music as the product of human imagination. He just yeah. saw it as potentially having a social role. I mean it's a very odd Way right. to look at yeah. and all and it. his and his and his, his gay's criticism two two essays uh, and with Coleman Hawkins. You know, who was an interesting transitional figure between uh, swing and Bob. between traditional uh, jazz of the uh, of the nineteen thirties. Uh, E.G. Louis Armstrong and Bob and Holman's, uh, Hawkins and his later stuff fits in uh, Bob. But there's no mention of Charlie Parker, there's no mention of Carl Hogan, of Coltrane, there's no mention of uh, um, Thelonious Monk. Or Tad Dameron, or Max Roach, none of that figures at all in his criticism of jazz. His criticism of jazz applies to uh, 1930s jazz, of which Hawkins was a very important uh, figure. But the rest of it is who? My father used to say, that's who. <laughs> I'm just wondering if that has something to do with, if I remember very vaguely, that he was in England when he was in the jazz clubs in London, and he was uh, seeing people dance with the jazz and the sense of false liberation that might come along with it. This kind of illusory sense of emancipation we equate with the 60s today, perhaps, uh, or Saul Bellow did, for example, that that was maybe part of it as well. Yes, he viewed a lot of it as, as distracting pop culture. Yeah. And but as a, but yeah. not seeing the production of the music 
as a, a moment of human development of the full capacities of a human. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you can look at the music as you know, a wonderful creation of human liberation. Yeah, and you don't have to talk about Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey mm -hmm. uh, to uh, make the argument. Yeah. You can talk about Coleman Hawkins in a different way. You can talk about Benny Goodman. Yeah. You can talk about uh, Roy Albert. Mm. I mean, there were a lot of people who he could have talked about and didn't. I see there's a gap in his, in his thinking. Uh, in his yeah. It's a sore. Yeah. Do you have any questions more of a, where are we? Yeah. You have any questions more about this news chapter? I have a question about I have a question about communist desire. Desire. Communist desire. Yeah. Yeah. Well, communist desire. is an absence in the presence of the achievement of the good life. And the good life is never achieved by individuals. Every individual advance implies another individual's loss. Listen, do you think that one takes pride in the academy to achieve what I achieved, which was a distinguished full professor. The distinguished meant I made $25,000 more than those who were not distinguished, which was the overwhelming majority. I felt that line very acutely. I feel that the, that the, uh, that the um, mass an underpaid, not only part-time uh, teachers, um, professors, but also full-time professors in state colleges and universities are being effectively hidden by the appointment of people like me. They want to make sure the public universities that they have names attached to their roster. And so they bought some people and other people they hired were not buying them and then they promoted them. Um, but it wasn't, it was to promote the institution. It wasn't that they said, now we're going to hide poverty, now we're going to hide underpayment, we're going to hide part-time uh, information. But it does help. and 65 distinguished professors who are alive at CUNY out of 7,000 7, full-time faculty. 160, 150 uh, distinguished professors. That's tiny. So next week we should read the beginning of One Dimensional Man, you said? I'm sorry? Next week we should read One Dimensional Man? One? All right, one, one man. Through, one through four. One through four. First section on One Dimensional Society. It's 123 pages, 122 pages, but it is not difficult reading compared to uh, magazine. One through four. So you admit Negri's hard. Right? <laughs>